Good morning and welcome to another week of United Way for Southeastern Michigan's What's the Word Wednesday, where we share important resources and have vibrant discussions about the topics that matter most to you. My name is Audrey Walker, and today we are here to learn more about support and mentorship for people who are recently incarcerated. With approximately 53,000 people currently incarcerated in Michigan, it is crucial that there are services available for people exiting incarceration and involved in the legal system. Uh, first, a few reminders for today's discussion. We will take questions from the audience, so please put your questions in the chat box if you're watching on Zoom or in the comments section if you're watching on Facebook. Closed captions are enabled in Zoom and Facebook Live. To turn them on, please click on the show captions button at the bottom of your screen. Today, we are joined by Tony Mills, mentor coordinator at Michigan Department of Corrections. Tony spent 10 years as a Michigan State Police Trooper and another 10 years as a branch manager at Secretary of State. In January 2022, he joined the Michigan Department of Corrections to build the Walk a Mile mentoring program. Tony, thank you so much for being with us here today, and please share more about the Walk a Mile Mentoring Program. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Always nice to speak with anyone from United Way. Uh, you all do amazing things in our communities, and uh, on that note, just keep up the great work. I do have a PowerPoint that helps keep me on track, so if it's okay if I go ahead and share my screen. I can pop this up full screen, we'll be in good shape. So our program is called Walk a Mile, and the title itself is a direct reference to the concept of peer mentoring. So our core group of mentors in our program will be people who themselves have the shared lived experience of incarceration and reentry. But to be perfectly clear, we are actively seeking non-peer mentors as well. Whether someone has ever been directly impacted by a criminal justice system or not, if someone has a big heart, a genuine desire to help, uh, I, I would love to speak with you about participating in the program. But moving forward here a little bit, a few things that I am going to try and touch on very quickly today. I'll talk a little bit about our history with mentoring as a department what our program goals are, what we're looking to do, various ways mentors can help, a little overview of the program, what it is, what it is not. I'll touch a little bit on our software and mentor reporting. I'll talk about the program analysis that we're having done, what we're looking for in mentors, and finally, kind of the big question for most people, why would I want to be a mentor with the MDOC Walk a Mile Mentoring Program? So as a department, we have had mentoring services available for our clients for a long time, but we've always basically outsourced that. We've historically partnered with community organizations around the state that has done mentoring on our behalf. And while historically most groups have done tremendous work, many groups have kind of come and gone, but in taking the strictly outsourcing approach, we've identified a few potential issues. First and foremost, it's not everywhere in the state. There are several groups around the Detroit area that do amazing work, several more around Grand Rapids and Muskegon. However, outside of those metropolitan areas, mentoring for our clients is either completely non-existent or at best very limited. The second issue is from group to group, there's no consistency as far as their program goals, measures and metrics, their mentor training. And finally, far too often we've found that unfortunately, for various reasons, our, our clients just don't make a good connection with the mentors they're paired with. That could be a personality conflict, a lack of common experience or interests, and that's almost always kind of a direct result of just by nature of an organization, their, their limited resources, limited pool of mentors. So unfortunately, sometimes an organization, while they do great work historically, they might only have one or two mentors available. And it's, it's let's put two people together and hope it works out. Um, I, I will say in all fairness to the groups, more often than not, it does. But with our program, what we're looking to do is in no way, shape or form, replace or circumvent 
those groups that do mentoring. We intend to continue to be very strong partners with them, but we want to give our clients options. Uh, for example, if someone discovers that a program with another group is not right for them, they might find our program more to their benefit. Or the opposite could be true. Our program might not be right and they might get more value from Detroit Rescue Mission Ministries or Fresh Coast Alliance. So our point of view is that the more options our clients have to be connected with a rock solid person, even if they have a mentor in our program and in other programs, uh, the more positive pro-social people they have in their life, the better it is all the way around. But for the above identified reasons for a long time, it's been on our departmental radar to develop our own program. Well, in 2019, our director, Heidi Washington, wrote into the strategic plan of the department that we are going to build our own program. Unfortunately, about that same time, COVID hit, slowed down us and the rest of the world for a few years. But again, January of last year, I was brought on board to ostensibly be the architect and administrator of this program. And over the past year and a half, I have been in contact with every Department of Corrections nationwide that runs any iteration of mentoring program for returning citizens, and also hundreds of community organizations, both within Michigan and nationwide, that have been doing this for a long time, drawing on their best practices, lessons learned, advice, to try to make our program the best it can possibly be. What we're looking to do with our program, like many things that we do at MDOC, first and foremost, we want to reduce recidivism for our program participants. I will probably say that in Michigan, we are at a historic low for recidivism, uh, about a little over 22%, but objectively that's still between one in four, one in five people that find themselves incarcerated again after a period of two to three years. We also wanna reduce what's known as the abscond rates. These are the number of times that someone just stop showing up for the report date. They disappear off the face of the earth. We wanna reduce what are known as technical violations. And these are things that are perfectly legal for the average citizen to do, but as a condition of parole, quite often you might have a curfew, you cannot consume alcoholic beverages. There's a laundry list of these things and they're all specifically tailored to each individual situation. But the point is someone can, and people are often do, uh, get returned to prison for too many technical violations or just one serious one. So we want to see those go down. And we also want to reduce the number of times that our program participants come in and they do not pass their alcohol or drug screen. Our secondary goals and objectives, we want to increase their overall optimism, their outlook on life, and perhaps most importantly, increase their confidence and their belief that they can successfully make it through the parole period without being returned to prison. It's typical human nature that your attitude leads to your actions, your actions lead to your outcome. So we wanna start right at square one, give them reason to believe they can be successful, they can make it through, they can turn things around. Various ways mentors can help. Now, before I go any further, I want to make it very clear that our parole agents work tirelessly to meet the needs of our clients. Their main job is to ensure that person's success in any way that they possibly can, whether that is employment, treatment, housing, making sure they have proper social supports. But the problem is we have a lot of people on parole, and it can sometimes become very difficult for an agent to give every client the, the personal attention they might need. Unfortunately, the situation is also many of our clients. Uh, due to being incarcerated, they find it very hard to trust someone. And they have a great fear that they are going to say or do the wrong thing, and they're gonna find themselves back incarcerated again. So far too often, our clients will come in on their report day, they'll meet with their agent, they'll sit there and nod their head and say, everything is wonderful when five things are going sideways in their life. In all fairness to the agent, if they don't know that someone lost their job or is homeless or is struggling with something, it, it, it's they, they can't do anything to address that issue. But in general, what we're looking to do with our mentors is very intentionally, very strategically place someone in their life that is that rock solid figure, someone that consistently role models positive behaviors, ways of thinking. In general, help them make their way back to free society following incarceration. 
whether that is in the area of employment, not necessarily finding them a job, but perhaps helping them polish their resume, work on their interviewing skills, help them with technology. Uh, the way I put it, the longer someone has been incarcerated, they might as well be paroled to Mars. Things like smartphones, navigating the internet, even touchscreen checkouts at the supermarket can be very challenging. So helping that person kind of get up to speed on, on all these quote unquote newfangled devices and technology. Sometimes helping them with available social services and programs. Again, our agents are very much in touch and in tune with what's out there, but new places open all the time. A mentor might have a lead on a new shelter, food bank, somewhere someone can get clothing, toiletries. In general, mentors provide a lot of encouragement to accept responsibility, not necessarily for what led to incarceration, but for that person's choices and actions moving forward. Helping that person regain a sense of personal empowerment. When you live a prolonged period where on a daily basis you're told when to go to bed, when to get up, when to shower, when to eat, when to go to class, when to do everything, and then 24 hours later you find yourself back in a free society and you're expected to make all your own decisions on your own, that can be very challenging. And also providing encouragement for them to continue to make positive changes moving forward. Most mentoring really comes down to having that person in their life that they can have very open, honest, difficult conversations that's not filled with judgment. Someone that can be very empathetic. These are conversations that for a lot of people, formerly incarcerated or not, can be difficult to have with a family member or a close friend because those sometimes come with a lot of baggage. Mentors can be very objective. They can share life experiences, give advice they might not hear from someone else. Goal setting is huge for a lot of our clients. We've all probably heard the good advice, try to think about what you would like your life to look like a year from now, five years from now, and, and what would it take to get there? Many of our clients, unfortunately, most of their life, their immediate goals are, where am I going to sleep tonight? Where's my next meal coming from? They've never had the opportunity, nor have they developed the skills to do any kind of long-term planning. Problem solving skills are, are huge. Uh, many of our clients have never done things like a simple pros and cons list, let alone something as complicated as a cost benefit analysis. So helping them develop positive pro-social problem solving skills, thinking beyond themselves, thinking about their ramifications of their actions. Mentors can, in the background, provide you know very positive encouragement for them to complete their treatment programs. They can assist them accessing community resources, especially if it's filling out an application for something online. Too many things to list, but it's kind of a snapshot of, of one of the myriad of ways mentors can truly be a big help to our clients. A few things about our program. Uh, we have not launched it yet. We're probably about a week, maybe two weeks away from launching. Uh, when we do launch, uh, it will be launched incrementally statewide. At this stage, we are looking to kick off the program at our offices uh, in Monroe County and Muskegon County. But very quickly after that, we are going to begin expanding the program to other counties in the state. And hopefully within a period of a few months, it will be available to our clients in every county. Participation for everyone in the program is voluntary. So for our clients, we are never going to mandate that they have a mentor. We are never going to consider it punitive or held against them if they decide not to participate. They're all adults. We are going to treat them as such. Our clients that do participate will do so at the permission of their parole agent. Not all of our clients are in a position where a mentoring program would be right for them at the moment. They might have so much going on, they don't have the, the time or the bandwidth to commit to a mentoring relationship. But the hard truth, too, is that not all of our clients are truly serious about changing their life. We're not trying to drag a horse to water that doesn't want to drink. We don't want to waste anyone's time, especially our mentors, who themselves also will be volunteer mentors. Many of our partners that do mentoring have paid mentors, and that is fantastic. But the dynamic here is different because as the department that has them on parole, we never want our clients to look at their mentor as someone who is an extension of the parole agent or who is beholden to the department. It would be perfectly reasonable for our clients to look at their mentor and think, I will never trust you. I will never believe we'll have a confidential conversation. 
because you're on the payroll of the department. And I believe that whatever I tell you, you're just going to run back and whisper in the ear of the agent. So volunteer mentors, volunteer mentees. We already talked a little bit about peer versus non-peer mentors. Again, we are actively recruiting both. In our program, males will mentor males, females will mentor females. We wanna make sure that no one's in a precarious position. Mentors and mentees will have complete and total flexibility as far as how often they meet, how long they meet, whether they meet in person, virtually, by phone, FaceTime, what have you. Again, everyone is an adult. We're going to let people decide their own schedules. We will have mentor training. It will be 100% online. It will be completely self-paced. Mentors do not have to fully complete mentor training before they start their mentoring relationship but we do ask that they make a diligent effort to complete it in a timely manner. Most of our mentoring will be one-on-one, -on -one, but we will support group mentoring where necessary or if preferred by our clients. We have purchased specialized software called MentorClick to assist us primarily in matching mentors and mentees. And the process very quickly, both mentors and mentees will complete a customized profile they will then complete a very short personality assessment. And then the software uses a proprietary algorithm drawing on all that information to give us a short list of best matches for each client with mentors in their area. We will use that as our starting point. We will still pair people up manually, but we will do so after having a long conversation with the potential mentor, with the mentee and the mentee's case agent. We wanna make sure that everyone's on the same page. We will ask that mentors report their mentoring contact, but it will be very easy. You can do it desktop, laptop, even an app on your smartphone. And all we're looking is for very high level basic information. When did you meet? How long did it last? Was it in person, virtual, phone call? What, just in terms of the topic, did you discuss? Did you set or achieve any goals? And lastly, anything that might be a gold star for that person. We will use that information in partnership with MSU, who is doing a program analysis for us, an independent uh, university level analysis. They are going to let us know, are we doing what we're setting out to do, reducing recidivism, technical violations, and so forth. Are our clients benefiting? Uh, are they benefiting more or less from peer versus non-peer? They'll give us a lot of good data. What are we doing well? What are we not doing so well? And how does everyone feel about it? They're going to anonymously survey them. They'll give us recommendations for improvement. And all this is being done ostensibly to make peer mentee, mentor or adult offender peer mentoring specifically a true evidence-based practice. Getting close to the end here, what we're looking for in our mentors, we would like someone to be at least 25 years old, be able to provide two non-family member references. I will interview each mentor applicant and again, be willing to complete mentor training. So kind of the big question, why would someone want to be a mentor in this program? In Michigan, 95% of the people that are incarcerated right now will come out on parole at some point. And when they do so, so they come right back to the same communities they left from. As human beings, we have a moral duty to help one another. And the bottom line is people tend to do what they know. So when someone is paroled, we can kick them out the door, wave our finger at them, say, I hope you learned your lesson, don't come back. And essentially what we're doing, we're hoping for the best. Flip side of that coin, we can all come together, provide support, provide resources, provide mentorship, and truly help them be their best. There are a lot of uh, benefits to being a mentor. Uh, you make communities safer. You make a life-changing difference for that person and their family. You'll get excellent training. It's good on a resume. You'll have opportunities for networking. Uh, we'll have a lot of events nationwide. Some of our mentors can go on to become peer recovery coaches, which are paid positions. But we do recognize that as a department, we can build the greatest mentoring program the world has ever seen. We have nothing but support for this program, literally from the director down to our parole agents in the field, people inside and out facilities. But that said, we cannot do it on our own. We need good people from every community to step up, invest a little bit of their time, a little bit of their heart to help make this world a better place. And on that note, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and open things up for any questions anyone might have.
Yeah, thank you so much, um, Tony, for sharing all that great information. And just as a reminder, if you have a question for Tony, you can send it to us in the chat box on Zoom or in the comment section on Facebook. And we hope to get to um, all the questions today. We also have some um, information here, Tony's information that you can get in touch with him and have also um, put that information in the chat box as well. So um, just a few questions to kind of start us off. I know you mentioned you're two weeks away from your launch here in Michigan, which is very exciting. Um, what are some, I, and you mentioned you did a lot of research across the country for a program like this. What are some um, examples or success stories that you can share that you've heard based on that, that research? Well, I, I guess the, the overarching thing that, that I found is that the, the bottom line is that anyone who has achieved any measure of success in their life, they have had a mentor of sorts in their life. Whether that was a formal mentor or not, it could have been a good parent, a teacher, a supervisor, a coworker, someone that has helped someone through a difficult or challenging period in their life. And as that specifically relates to this program, uh, I, there are more stories than I can count in reaching out to all these departments and groups nationwide of people that had a strong mentor in their life, and they are now CEO of their own company. They are the president of a nonprofit. They own their own businesses. They they are doing wonderful things in the communities. Um, one gentleman that, that I know, his name is Aaron Kinzel. He is now a tenured lecturing professor at the University of Michigan. He is a formerly incarcerated person, and he is a huge advocate not only of this program, but criminal justice reform in general. But he will be the first to tell you that he had many people in his life that were mentor figures for him. We all need that strong presence in our life, someone we can learn from, someone to guide us through a difficult time. Yeah, definitely. Um, appreciate you sharing that. And I know that's why we're sharing all this information today too about how people can get involved. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned a little bit about what it's like to be that um, non-peer mentor, <clears throat> but can you uh, review again, maybe how much time is expected for people to spend um, in this capacity as a mentor? And, and like, is it in person or virtual? I know you had mentioned the tool that you all will be using. Can you go into that a little bit further? Absolutely. Objectively, we would ask that our mentors, peer or non-peer, try to commit to the mentoring relationship for one year. Complete transparency. We would hope that if you've developed that relationship and you've been with that person for a year, that you will then continue to stick with them until they are off parole. But again, the bottom line is each mentor and mentee will decide their own schedule. You have complete flexibility regarding how often you meet, how long those meetings last, and whether those meetings are in-person, virtual, phone call, FaceTime, what have you. And then is there like a mentor coach or somebody that the mentors are checking in with as far as like if they're going to set something up in person or um, that sort of thing? Absolutely. Myself, I, I am uh, the, the head of our program, but our entire offender success unit is, is available as a resource. We also would like all of our mentors to be in contact with their mentee's parole agent. Um, that's a bit of a fine line because, again, we want our mentors to, to not be directly connected to MDOC, but to be able to use that uh, the, the parole agent as a resource. Uh, myself, the agent, our staff, if they have any questions, if they have any concerns, if they need any direction as far as resources, the entire department is here for them. Great. And you also mentioned that the training is online and it's self-paced. Can you give us an idea of what some of the, th the pieces of the training are like or the sections of the training that people would be learning in the mentor training? Absolutely. So our mentor training objectively is to equip everyone with a solid foundation to be effective mentors in our program. So our, our modules include everything from uh, avoiding manipulation and boundary setting, but they also dive into topics such as trauma-informed care and ACEs. Uh, there's an introduction to motivational interviewing. 
There is a module on growth mindset, modules on communication, goal setting. Um, again, just to, to help everyone, especially our non-peer mentors, understand how it is someone ended up incarcerated. And, and on that note, I always like to make the point that um, many people in communities without being directly impacted by the criminal justice system kind of have uh, a view that people coming out of prison on parole, they're, they're scary. They're the boogeyman. They're the boogeywoman. In reality, almost everyone who finds themselves incarcerated, and, and there are exceptions, but the vast majority of people have gone through a childhood and adolescence and early adulthood full of trauma, full of poverty, full of exposure to or direct involvement with substance use disorder, violence, a lot of bad circumstances that, that accumulate in them making a very bad decision. And the vast majority of people that come out on parole truly want to turn their life around. But the problem is, and, and I, I hate to disparage anyone, but societally, we, we can be very hypocritical because just about everyone will look at that person and say, okay, you've paid your debt to society. Now I want and, and expect for you to get a job, have a place to live, you know, be involved in the community, do positive things, be a quote unquote productive member of society. The problem is there are so many people that in the next breath will step back and say, but I don't want to work with you or give you a job. I don't want to live near you. I don't want to be involved with you. I'm going to keep you at arm's length. Mm -hmm. And 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 those two are, are diametrically opposed. Mm -hmm. We cannot expect anyone to be successful if they have no opportunities, if, if they're socially isolated, if they're looked at as a pariah for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely a very important point. And I really appreciate you uh, pointing that out to us on this because that you know, the, it seems like the mentor program is really trying to create that positive experience for everybody. And it's why, you know, it's so important um, to our community. And we're glad to hear about when it launches here in Southeastern Michigan and hear about its success, I'm sure, in other parts of the state as well. So uh, we wish you all the best with that and, and really appreciate everyone who's taking the time to watch today and hopefully contact um, Tony and his department and seeing how you can participate in, in <clears throat> excuse me, in the mentor program as well. So we thank you so much, Tony, for being here and sharing all of your um, information and resources on mentorship. And uh, before we close, I do have just a few updates for um, the audience today as well. Um, <clears throat> as a reminder, for anyone experiencing a need in our community, um, our 211 helpline is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And this includes resources like food, utilities, assistance, and much, much more. We always maintain a running list of available services in the community and can connect you to the support you need. You can also um, look up resources in your area by using our 211 resource database at unitedwayscm.org slash 211. Um, as far as volunteering goes, if you're looking for opportunities to get involved in the community as a volunteer, United Way's volunteer portal can help. Our online portal lets you search volunteer opportunities that best match your abilities, needs, and interests. It even lets you set up alerts for the types of volunteer projects or organizations you care most about. Um, so please visit unitedwaysem.org slash volunteer to get started. And with that, um, our next town hall on the next What's the Word Wednesday town hall, it's a panel discussion focused on mental health, specifically for Black, Indigenous, and people of color, also known as BIPOC. Um, taking place on Wednesday, July 26th, we'll have several mental health uh, practitioners joining us in recognition of BIPOC Mental Health Month. Um, be sure to stay tuned for that town hall and more that we have coming up um, to stay updated on upcoming topics and watch any replays of previous 